What is up, MMA True Believers? I am Jason Burgos for SureDog.com, and tonight the conversa conversation may get a little spicy because I have the pleasure of speaking with a man heading into his 10th fight of the, for the UFC in, in, in UFC Rio Rancho on February 15th. On that night, he will face his 33 fight UFC veteran and always tough t Jim Miller, and that man is old hot sauce himself, Scott Holtzman. Scott, Mr. Saucer. Thank you for giving me some time tonight before your next step into the octagon. Yes, sir, Jason. I appreciate it, man. And thanks for having me on. Yep, UFC Rio Rancho coming up. It's almost like UFC Rio, but not <laughs> nearly as exciting. I had to. I want to ask you that because I'm going to talk to somebody tomorrow that's also on the Rio. Uh, K Casey Kenny. He's going to be on the car too. Now, when I first heard UFC Rio Rancho. I got to be honest, I didn't know where the hell Rio Rancho was. I thought maybe Mexico, Same. maybe Brazil, when you were told of the booking and it was going to be on Rio Rancho, did you have any idea where the heck Rio Rancho was? Nope, I had no idea. So I was, as you can imagine, extremely disappointed. But uh, most of the time, most of the time they just book dates yeah. before they ever have a location. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just knew that we were on a February 15th, mm. but they didn't know where it was. So course when that location came out um you know i was a little disappointed but it doesn't really matter you know by now i've fought in so many arenas they're all the same yeah you know it's just a bunch of people with a, a jumbotron and an octagon so it doesn't really matter as long as they got a whole foods and uber there i'm good <laughs> hopefully they do have all those things now i had the pleasure of being in the building covering your your fight at ufc newark and i really enjoyed your post fight scrum because of, of how genuine and and most importantly, grateful you were in front of the media and, and after the fight. Now, one thing that stood out was mentioning you are a hillbilly from Tennessee. Now, I am in New York City, you know, born and raised, so I, I don't run in across many hillbillies. I don't go upstate in the Appalachians too much. You know, for me and for the people that watch this, what makes a hillbilly a hillbilly? Because a hillbilly is different than, say, a, a redneck, right? Those are two different kind of things. Yeah, I would say so. I think I think hillbillies are a little more friendly. <laughs> That's uh, good. But I think I think there are some redneck tendencies deep <laughs> down in there. Um, currently, I have all my teeth. <laughs> That's two, good. The, the two front teeth are fake, and at one point I was missing one of them uh, back a, a couple years ago or last year at one of my fights. But uh, yeah, just people from the hills, man, raised on Mountain Dew and uh, pinto beans and cornbread. So. <laughs> Different sort of people, but uh, we can fight, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I feel like we've gotten closer because, one, I like pinto beans, and two, one of my te front teeth are also fake. So look at this. I, I am on my way to hillbilly status, I feel like. But, you know, you, you mentioned in the post-fight that you played also professional hockey, which, and correct me if I'm wrong, but did you play for the Knoxville Ice Bears? Is that correct? Yep, I sure did. I had a, uh, a cup of coffee, as they would say. <laughs> With Knoxville Ice Bears, so um, you know, just just trying to extend uh, the non real wor world uh, work a little mm -hmm. further after college. Uh, you know, I had some friends who were playing professional hockey at the time, and and sort of talked me into to playing and trying, and uh, you know, did really well, made it all the way through, and um, there towards the end got cut and kind of bounced around on some other teams and uh, got sent to another league, and and that was kind of it for me. <laughs> Uh, didn't want it bad enough, but I uh, learned a lot of things along the way. And obviously uh, with professional sports, a lot of people try their entire lives to, to make, to make it for one sport. Uh, and when they don't make it, the dream's kind of over. So for me, I've, I've been lucky and I've taken some lessons from, from hockey and I played college baseball too. And at the highest level fighting uh, arguably, you know, one of the, the best lightweight fighters of all time here in, a few days. So, so I mean, because you know, I mean, yeah, the state has a professional yeah. hockey team in Tennessee, but for you, you you weren't even a guy that was playing hockey at some point in your youth. You just got into it straight away, right into that professional level, which is kind of crazy and pr and pretty damn impressive all at the same time. Well, I I played hockey was really, baseball was really my first love, uh, but once I discovered hockey about ten years old, I okay. I played hockey. Yeah, so I played since I was ten years old and course i'm a super athlete too so um any anything i choose to do i'm going to be good at uh, so um i was committed to hockey and and played my entire life played on some really good teams uh believe it or not here in in knoxville and 
uh, there's some good good hockey in Nashville because the auto industry. Uh, we get a lot of, of parents of kids from Detroit uh, and Michigan up north auto industry. So I uh, played a lot of good hockey growing up and uh, kind of led me there, part of the journey. Uh, another key part of the, the media scrum after your last fight was, you know, talking about your changed outlook on life because of your son. You know, you grew up, you also mentioned you grew up with a, uh, about your father really being around and get it, didn't get those parenting tools that, you know, may come from that. I myself am in a similar situation, you know, from a similar background in a similar situation now. How specifically has being a father changed how you, in general, see the world and just look at your career now? I think it's changed it big time. Obviously, there's added motivation there. I think you know anybody who has kids will tell you that. Um, but you know, I, you know, same story as you know, maybe you. I just didn't have a lot of positive role models coming up. Um, you know, I didn't really have anybody to say, hey, you know, when you meet somebody, look them in the eye, shake their hand, um, you know, say yes, sir, don't curse in public. I was just, kind of, you know. I didn't really have any guidance. I didn't have anybody to tell me what was right or wrong. And, you know, and when I see my son now and, and obviously I, I see other parents and kind of telling their kids what to do and how to do it. But for me, I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to just tell them. I'm going to try and show them too. I'm going to try and be a positive role model, but not just preach it, but do it. Show them how to attain goals, show them how to get what you want, show them how to uh, go about a daily process. So um, that, that's kind of been big for me. And, and, uh, you know, I just want to be the person, uh, that I never had growing up. So, uh, it's, it's been some good motivation and, uh, you know, holds me accountable too. After your win, you mentioned you wanted to fight the winner of Guida versus Miller, which is on the same card, and that is exactly what you're getting. You know, however, that was all the way in August. And are you disappointed you did not get back into the cage, you know, far sooner, or was there a specific reason maybe for you that you you aren't fighting for almost like six plus months now? No, I tried. I'm disappointed. I, I it's weird. The UFC is weird because all these fighters, uh, nobody wants to fight throughout the year. <laughs> Then all of a sudden, when December rolls around, everybody says, oh, I need to fight before the end of the year. <laughs> so there's there's this big bottleneck mm. right in December. Uh, so, you know, I tried for the December card. I think there was a December card in Vegas. I tried for that one. Didn't happen. They pushed to January. Um, and then all of a sudden pushed to February. So we just kept getting pushed back and back and back. But um, I've known about the matchup for a little while, but. I tried to fight sooner. It just, you know, everybody thinks they need to fight in December for some reason and uh, kind of put me in the back of the line. How does that happen? Do you like your management contacts them says, he's ready, he, he's ready to go. Do, do they say, okay, we're, we might pair you up with these guys. These might make sense as possible fights. Okay, we'll contact them. You find out they're not interested or is it, or is it just basic? Like you, you know, you match with contacts them and you're just waiting to hear back and you just never hear back. Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Uh, my manager will reach out and say, hey, we're looking at uh, December return or we want to try for these cards or who can we get. Um, but I think for me what's also taking a little longer is I'm just outside the rankings. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting, delicate situation because none of the ranked guys want to fight down. Uh, everybody wants to fight up and get into the rankings. And, and you know, when you're semi-dangerous – and just outside the rankings, nobody wants to take a chance. So there's only a handful of guys, really, that make sense to fight. Um, you know, those 15 through 20 guys. Uh, so you just – they're not always available. Not everybody's available at the right time. And it's just about timing and, and you know, how many guys are available. So uh, I knew that Jimmy would be ranked right outside uh, on the fringe of the rankings and – Obviously, he was fighting the same night as me, so I knew he'd be available again. Um, he didn't really have to fight me, I didn't think, but I'm glad he's he's decided to. Um, I think the fans are going to win in this one for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, you, you got in this game late. You know, like we talked about, you did the pro hockey and stuff like that. You came from that, but have done well for yourself despite the, the, the steep learning curve, which surely includes things like grappling. Now, Miller is a great grappler. Likewise, for Guida, if you would have fought him. 
two of your losses in the UFC have been to strong rap wrestlers, you know, Josh Ahmed yep. and Nick Lance. Is, is part of wanting this fight to challenge, not only because of the name value of both men and you want to get in there with big names, but to also challenge yourself in an area you are still trying to catch up on, on with a lot of guys, to try and get over that, that key hurdle in your evolution as a mixed martial artist and beat a very good grappler. Yeah, I mean, this this fight's as much about me as it is, you know, anything else. Um, you know, I'm out here to prove things to myself, too. I'm not I'm not really doing this for anybody else. <laughs> uh, I guess if, if you were, it'd be a short day at the office. But, you know, I just, I, I want validation that, you know, everything I've worked for is, is you know, not in vain. And, um I really think this camp, I've uh, I've really dialed in on some details on wrestling and grappling that have gotten me beat in the past. I have been beat. I mean, some of those losses, they've come down to one or two takedowns or a few grappling positions, and that's what's lost it for me. So um, I really believe that I'm a lot tighter in that area. So I'm excited to to show that and, and uh, put on a good – a good scrap here. Jim Miller has hung around so long and been successful in the UFC because he is just he's a straight grappler. You know, he he isn't necessarily a dominant wrestler, he isn't a jujitsu guy. He blends both elements well and it is a handful on the mat. Where does he rank with some of those other grapplers that I mentioned? Is he the best guy you've faced so far? And and if he is the best guy, why is that? What makes him a little different than those other guys you've faced before? Yeah, I mean I think so. I think grappling wise, if you put on a gi and a, a belt, a colored belt, then uh, he's going to beat those other guys. He's he's for sure extreme grappler. Been doing it a long time. Submitted a lot of really good guys. Fought all the best guys in the world. I mean, everybody knows his credentials. Yeah. Everybody's seen what he can do. Um, it's just a matter of, of uh, putting the fight where I think my tools can beat his tools. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not going to put my gi out there and go roll around on the mat with him. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I don't plan on doing that. And it's my job to... Uh, put myself in the best position possible to win. And that's not really rolling around on the mat. I don't care about that. Um, that's just not my style. The fans don't want to see that either. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to try to keep it away from that. It, 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 you know, how, what, because that, that's pretty much going to the direction of where I was going to ask because, you know, that's not his forte. Yeah, Jim Miller's a tough guy, but, you know, striking is not where he does his best. But you are a guy, you know, you want to be a, a dog and mix it up in a, in a phone booth with somebody, you know. How much is, is, is the emphasis in camp? Like, how does it break down for you? Obviously, you have the strength and in, in, in striking. So is the camp worrying about, you know, getting takedowns, stuffing the takedowns, working your way back up. Is it about preparing for submissions? Do you have to do all those things? Like, like, what is your, you know, particular preparation for him to make sure you stay on the feet and play it where you become the black belt? Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily see him as a bad striker. Uh, I think he's a pretty good striker. I'm, I've obviously watched him. Everybody knows him. Uh, is he a better grappler than striker? You know he's a good grappler. He's got a lot of submissions. I think he's a good a good uh, striker too. I think the fight's going to be a little bit of everything. Um, I'm prepared to really fight everywhere. Uh, I think it's going to be two straight cats and a sack pretty much for the for the entire 15 minutes. So I'm kind of prepared for everything. Um, you know he's going to shoot in. He always does. Mm. Everybody knows that. He he blends the entire game together. So uh, I'm pretty much ready for everything. So but when he comes in my zone, I'm swinging on him, that's for sure. <laughs> Miller is actually the same age as you, and oddly enough, me and him are, are both Virgos for a weird, you know, fun fact to get right <laughs> out there. You know, his birthday is actually a week after mine, a few weeks before yours. However, his 36 is a much different one with 44 bouts worth of camps and fighting and wear and tear. A lot of people will say, you know, he has a huge advantage because of his experience, but However, you know, would you say, you know, you have a huge athleticism, speed, power advantage against him because you don't have that wear and tear of, you know, of, of so many years, so many fights in this sport, which is so brutal and the training is so brutal. You, while you both are the same age, you are very different body and athleticism wise yeah. at this point. No, I mean, I, I got to tip my hat to him, man, for that many <laughs> fights. I'd be, I'd be in a wheelchair probably by now. <laughs> But uh, yeah, with that being said, I think it's two it's two totally different types of 36. Yeah. I'm I'm a fresh, brand new 36. Um, I I feel I still feel as good physically and athletically as I did when I was 30, and and uh, I, I'm still fighting at a high level and and beating up 25 year olds 
so uh, I feel good. And, you know, I think he's looked really good lately. I, I don't think – I can only assume that he feels as good as I feel, even though he's fought that much. Uh, I know he, he's coming off that Lyme's disease. Uh, that was a pretty big story there for a bit. Yeah. Uh, I can only assume that he's the best he's ever been. So uh, that's what I'm prepared for. I'm, I'm prepared for old New Jersey tough Jimmy. So I'm, I'm bringing Tennessee tough hot sauce, uh, and, and we're going to see. We're going to see. It's going to be two straight cats in a bag, and we're going to see who's better that night. Now, your father, like I, we talked about earlier, you know, you have a new home, which you mentioned in the post fight at the last fight. Um, you, you know, you, you'll be 37 in September. Is there a, a new pressure you have hanging over you because of those various factors? You know, you, you really have to make this career pay off as much as you can because it, the likelihood of you re still completing in 10 years from now is going to be hard. It's, it's just hard in such a grueling industry. Does it change your motivation, your fire? You know, does it make your worth ethic in the gym? Is your work ethic different now than, say, two, three years ago when your career started because of the, that edit? You know, you got a mouth to feed. You got a new house. To, you know, yeah. it's, uh, the thing's different for you when preparing. Yeah, I don't think so, man. I, You know, when I started, it wasn't really about the money. Like I, I said, I, I was an athlete and a competitor. So I always think in the beginning my why was just because I love to compete. Mm -hmm. So – I don't necessarily think I work any uh, harder now or less hard or anything like that, but uh, make no mistake, man, I need that money. <laughs> That's for sure. I, uh, you know, I got a baby in a, a new house, and um, I'm relying on those two checks. So uh, one check makes things awful, awful difficult. So, um, you know, it's it's you know, and I know he's getting paid really well. He's getting paid more than me, so. Um, <laughs> I'd like to think that I'm a little more hungry and in, in my wallet than he now, is. Now, last question. Does hot sauce have a favorite hot sauce or flavor of hot sauce? You know, And does hot sauce like ghost pepper hot? Like, what's your level of preference of hot? Ooh. Do you like it really hot or not so-so? <laughs> Man, I don't know. You know, like we said, I'm 36 <laughs> now, so... <laughs> I don't know if I like ghost pepper <laughs> hot anymore. I get people send me stuff all the time, uh, and they try to burn me up. I get like these extreme hot sauces, and I had a guy send me these ghost peppers, and they were like fluorescent red, and he wanted me to eat them and take videos. And I'm like, man, I just don't trust. <laughs> but I'd say my favorite hot sauce. I got. I'm whittling away now. I got three of them on the table right now. But this is my favorite right now. This. Uh, it's called Dave's. I think. Dave's, it's like a mango. Oh, that sounds good. Nice. Citrus. It's right. good. I picked it up at Target. And this was a random one uh, that was sent to me. Why can't I get the camera there <laughs> on uh, Instagram? And then I, always, okay. I got old faithful Texas Pete. This is extra hot. It's pretty good. There, I've had too. that one. It's pretty good. I like that one. Yeah. It's pretty spicy for just a, a regular sauce. But there's one called Truff. They send me stuff all the time. It's kind of a gourmet hot sauce. It's do you have good. the hot sauce sponsorship? How do you, you have to have the sponsorship? No. No, I I did some. Uh, I did a commercial for Cholula all one right. time, but I haven't, yeah, I haven't signed anything exclusive. I'm holding out for my own brand. So, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. so are we? Are you in the kitchen developing a new hot sauce? Should we expect at some point we're gonna have hot yeah. sauces, hot sauce coming out? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think you can expect that eventually, but. Right now, I gotta. I have to focus on kicking ass. So, um, I kind of get in the kitchen and do what I need to do, but I can't get too crazy yet. <laughs>